Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about something very practical, how to map DTOs manually in .NET. Now that Automapper has moved to a commercial license, some teams might start rethinking their dependency on it. And even aside from the licensing, sometimes it just makes sense to have full control over your mapping, especially when you care about performance, maintainability, or just want to avoid magic. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through how to handle DTO mapping yourself in a clean, simple way that works well for most applications, whether you're building a web API, a service layer, or even a desktop app, and all of this without using any third-party libraries like Automapper or Mapster. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, now's a great time. I post practical .NET tips like this every week. Let's jump in. All right, let's start with a quick refresher. What is a DTO? DTO stands for Data Transfer Object. It's a class you use to shape the data you send or receive, usually between your backend and frontend, or across different parts of your app. You don't want to expose your actual domain or database entities directly to clients, right? Those entities often contain things you want to keep private, or just unnecessary fields that don't belong in the response. Let's get into the code and see how we can handle this mapping manually, in a clean and maintainable way. I've already set up a .NET 9 ASP .NET Core minimal app project to walk through this. So to start, we've got a product entity like this. Let's quickly break that down. ID is the primary key, just a unique identifier for each product. Name is a string that holds the product's name. Price is a decimal. Quantity is just how many units we have in stock. And finally, created at stores the date and time the product was created. Pretty straightforward, right? This is the entity we're going to be mapping to and from our DTOs. Now that we've looked at the product entity, let's take a look at how I've set up the endpoints in this project. Here's a method called map product endpoints. What this does is group all the product related routes together just to keep things clean and organized. This is a get request to slash products. It just returns all products from the repository, simple and clean. This endpoint handles something like slash products slash five. It tries to get the product by its ID. If it's found, we return it with 200 OK. Otherwise, we return a 404 not found with a message. Also, we're giving this route a name, get product by ID, which helps us reference it later when we return the result of a post. This one is a post request to slash products used for creating a new product. The product comes in from the request body and we just call repository create product to save it. Then we return a 201 created and link it back to our get product by ID route. Here we're updating a product by its ID. We first check if the product exists. If not, return 404. If it does, we update it using the incoming data, then return 204 no content. And finally, this is the delete endpoint. It works pretty much the same way. Check if the product exists, and if so, delete it. Otherwise, return a 404. So that's a quick walkthrough of the endpoints. Everything is using an iProduct repository interface, which is nice because it keeps the data access logic separate and testable. Now, let's move on to the DTOs and talk about how we can map those manually to our product entity. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a new file called productdoos.cs. This file will contain the DTOs we'll be using for create, update, and response operations, just to keep things nice and organized. Let's go ahead and add that now. So what is this? This is a C-sharp record, which is great for lightweight data containers like DTOs. It's called create product request, and it just has the three properties we actually care about when someone wants to create a new product. Name, that's the product's name. Price, the cost of the product and quantity, how many units we're adding. Here you'll notice we're not including fields like ID or created at here. That's intentional. Those values are either auto-generated or managed by the system, so the client has no reason to send them. This way, we're only accepting exactly what we need, and we keep our API more secure and intentional. Next, let's create the DTO for updating an existing product. And this one's super easy because it's almost identical to the create product request, just with one extra field. Add ID field here. Why ID? Because when we're updating a product, we need to know which product we're updating. So we include the ID in the request body along with the new values for name, 
price, and quantity. Again, we're not touching created at or anything like that. That kind of field should typically be handled internally by the application, not passed in from the client. Now, we've talked about the input DTOs, the ones we use for creating and updating products. Let's add one more, a response DTO, something we return back to the client when they fetch product data. I just copied the update product request and change as product response. So yeah, it's basically the same structure as the update DTO. We've got the ID, name, price, and quantity. This one's used purely for sending product data back to the client in a clean and consistent format. And again, if you ever want to include more fields later, like a created at timestamp or a status, you can just extend this without touching your core entity. That's the beauty of DTOs. All right, now that all our DTOs are in place, let's move on and write the mapping methods to go from these DTOs to the entity and vice versa. I'm going to add a new file called productdtoextensions.cs. This is where we'll define a few simple extension methods so we can convert back and forth between our DTOs and the product entity in a really readable way. First, add static to product DTO extensions class. All right, now let's write the first mapping method inside our product DTO extensions class. We're going to map from the product entity to the product response DTO. This is what we'll use when we want to return product data to the client, like in a GET request. I will name this method as to DTO and add this product entity as the parameter. That allows us to call this method like product.toDTO wherever we need it, super clean. Then inside, we just return a new product response and pass in the values from the entity, ID, name, price, and quantity. This kind of mapping keeps things explicit and easy to follow, and you're fully in control of what gets returned to the client. All right. Next, let's do the reverse, mapping from the DTO to the entity, starting with the create product request. So again, we're using an extension method. I will name this method as to entity, and this time on create product request. That means we'll be able to write code like request dot to entity when we're handling a create operation. Inside the method, we're just creating a new product entity and assigning values from the request, name, price, and quantity and setting created at to daytime.utc now. Notice we're not setting the ID here, because that usually gets generated by the database when a new record is inserted. That's exactly what we want. All right, now let's move on to the update product request, which is almost the same, but this time we will include the ID. I will just copy the one we wrote for create product request, since most of the fields are the same, and then made a couple of small tweaks. So the only real difference here is that we're setting the ID. Because when we're updating a product, we already know which one it is. It's already in the database, and we're just changing its values. Here, we remove created at because it sets values when a new product is created. All right, that wraps up the mapping methods. Now let's go plug them into our endpoints and actually use them. Let's take a look at the get all products endpoint and update that to return DTOs instead of exposing the entity directly. Right now, it's just returning the list of product entities as is, but we don't really want to expose our domain entities directly. So instead, we'll map each product to a product response. Let's update it like this. We're calling get all from the repository, which gives us a list of products. Then we use select method to convert each one to a product response. Now the client only gets what they need, no internal fields, no unnecessary data. Just clean, shaped responses. All right, next let's fix the get by ID endpoint to do the same. Again, this is returning the full entity, which we want to avoid. So let's update the response to return a product response DTO using to DTO method. This way, even when requesting a single item, your API keeps that same clear contract. It only returns what's needed. All right. Next, let's update the post endpoint to use the create product request and the mapping logic we wrote earlier. Before, we were accepting a product entity directly in a request, but now want to change that to use our create product request DTO. We now take in a create product request. Then we call our extension method request.toEntity to convert it into a product entity. Now let's move on to the put endpoint for updating an existing product. We don't want to accept a raw product entity anymore. Instead, 
we'll use our update product request DTO, map it manually, and then pass the mapped entity to the repository. We map the request to a full product entity using request.toEntity and pass that to our update method. Now, for the delete endpoint, there's actually no need to change anything. The logic remains the same because we're simply deleting a product by its ID. And that's a wrap for today's video. We've successfully covered how to manually handle DTO mapping in .NET without relying on third-party libraries. You now have a clean and efficient way to map your data transfer objects, DTOs, to your entities and vice versa. Remember, this approach keeps your code base lightweight, gives you more control, and ensures that you're only exposing what's necessary to your clients. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you won't miss any of my future .NET tutorials. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Happy coding!